I'm Josh Cooperman, host and publisher of Convo by Design, and this is a new series of the show called The Design Messengers, a Monday episode of the show sharing design trade info you need to know. Sometimes it's, it's really not what you need to know, but what you should know. This is an audio essay shining a light on a few simple ideas that make this industry so amazing. <laughs> I have long held passion and fascination with the set decorators that craft the sets for some of our favorite TV shows, movies, live performances, and yes, even commercials. I'm not sure if I told you this before, but Hollywood set design runs in my family, not as a set decorator, but as prop house owner, purveyor, and provider of objects meant to decorate sets. My uncle Earl was the founder and owner of EC Props, now known as uh, EC Prop Rentals. They provide the less glamorous, gritty objects you might find on an industrial set, a back alley, commercial environment, or city street. I remember him telling me how he got into the business. He was a teamster driving for CBS. He found a few dirt mats. These are... um, rollable rugs that basically look like dirt, but don't leave behind any residue, right? They're, they're manufactured this way. The, the ground that set decorators would use to dress an outdoor set, like a campground. Uh, a much younger me asked my Uncle Earl if I could see one, because I, I just was fascinated by the idea, and he laughed. He said, no, because he never saw them. They're always rented out. They went from one set decorator to the next, and they were always rented. They were always gone, always making money. I never even thought at that time that that was a way to make money, renting dirt mats, uh, or what he later did, you know, because he did. And instead of finding beautiful objects that you might find decorating the sets of the, of the, of the time, of the era, like Heart to Heart or Designing Women, he was the purveyor of objects like dumpsters, transformers, tools, and lockers for a 1988 episode of, of a show like O'Hara, starring Pat Morita and decorated by Robin Royce, or Crime Story, a show starring Dennis Farina featuring the acting talents of, oh my gosh, are you ready? Gary Sinise, David Caruso, Andrew Dice Clay, Pam Greer, Ving Rames, and even cameos by the likes of Miles, Miles Davis as himself, of course. Produced by Michael Mann, with set decoration by Linda Lee Sutton. Sutton, by the way, still a working set decorator with 2023 credits uh, that include NCIS Hawaii. My Uncle Earl is sadly uh, sadly no longer with us, but his legacy and prop house remain. That is one thing I find so interesting. Legacy, as it relates to design and architecture. Architecture is a little different, I think, because, you know, a a falling water or a Disney concert hall, these will always garner attention, while the interior design of an existing uh, incredible Manhattan apartment, unless published, might get no such love. You, You may never know it's there. You may never have seen the work of the designer unless they're promoting it on their socials or on the website. But, but for the most part, designers and their, cli- their clients don't want people seeing the inside of, of their environment, so they don't promote it and publish it. I want to share the stories of some incredible set decks with you. How they do what they do, why they do it, where you might have, have seen their work, what they love about it, and what they would like you to know. If you love entertainment, this will be enjoyable for you. If you are a designer, this will be invaluable for you to change the thought process from work to lasting legacy, from a project to a storytelling set that makes better the lives and the characters who inhabit a real life environment, a real set. What I find so incredible about set decks is their ability to read literally between the lines of a script to uncover the true essence of each character as defined by their environments. What does the decor say about the character? How, how does the character live? Why does that 
affect their relationship or how does that affect their relationships with other characters? Without set design, there is no story. You can have dialogue, you can have stage direction, you can have acting, you can have writing, but there is no context. Set decks create the environment, often in very difficult and challenging circumstances. Can you derive a set through AI, which is what a lot of people are asking? Sure, yeah, you, you, you can create a piece of graphic art through AI. Sure, yeah, you can. But two things to consider. These are a complex derivative of many other pre-existing works. And it's based on prompts, not souls. In other words, when you get a picture from AI, that's not an original piece. It's a, it's a composite of many other things. And because it wasn't a person who provided that, it, only a set of prompts, you don't get a soul in that. You really don't. It's, a, it's an ab academic exercise at, at best until AI gets better. Set decorators are, are truly givers of life in very much the same way as a writer or actor. They create the environment for a director to mold and craft their vision for a finished product. But we don't celebrate the set decorators the same way, with the same passion as actors, directors, or even the writers. A and I get the sense from the many that I've spoken to that many of them are perfectly fine with that, provided you let them continue to work the way they do and compensate them fairly. Right? Who does that sound like, designers? Anyway, this is going to be an ongoing addition to the Design Messengers. We're going to come back and talk to more set decorators because it's amazing what they have to say. Thank you to the Set Decorator Society of America for helping set this up. You are going to hear from Jan Pascal, David Smith, Julie Drock, and Claire Kaufman. Up first, Don Deers. Hi there, I'm Don Deers, and I'm a set decorator here in Hollywood. I'm a member of Local 44 and the Set Decorator Society of America, the SDSA. Um, and I have been in the art department for 40 years. Um, I started in the 80s uh, as uh, an art department PA. Uh, my first film was The Nightmare on Elm Street and segued me into several years working with the same production designer, uh, Greg Fonseca, and eventually sort of then a segue into uh, both set decorating and on-set dressing, um, which were both, uh, I think, very informed my uh, career because uh, my first jobs, again, I was pretty green. Being an on-set dresser, you are responsible for everything the pr production designer, the decorator left on set, and you're supposed to make work for the action or whatever should be shot and keep continuity and blah, blah. And so having lived through that experience of uh, I, you know, I don't want to leave the set people with, you know, enormously heavy furniture or I have to be thinking about continuity or damage or any number of things of, you know, relationships with crew. Um, as I segued up in the art department as assistant art director and eventually art directing for 10 years, um, non-union stuff, um, I also learned a lot from that, you know, and I think um, my... My, my journey into set decorating kind of happened when I was on this film I was art directing called Red Rock West, which was this Nicolas Cage noir um, western. And Kate Sullivan was the decorator on it. And at some point she was like, almost like talking in voices and like, you know, channeling the characters. And it was, you know, it was one, I, I talked to her about it and she's, like, and she's like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to like figure out what they would do or what they have or, you know, like, and, and I realized I do that. And like, I, that's how I relate to interiors is like who and how and what, what, what happened before and, you know, sort of backstory or whatever. And so uh, soon after that, I segued into set decorating and I've been doing that uh, for, you know, a long time now. I think when you see a film, I think everybody, first of all, including the crew, you walk on a set, a lot of times crew don't even know that we did anything, right? So first of all, I think you have to know that almost any set has to be blessed by both the director, the production designer, and the set decorator. And 
in many shows, people walk in, like I said, and the crew are like, oh, this place is great. They don't actually realize how much work has gone into analyzing it, breaking down the script, having backstory that might have a payoff later, like an Easter egg or, or a payoff or some exposition that was brought up in scene one that you now need to pay off in scene 40. And there's a lot of prep that is not accidental, that that stuff is thought through. And secondly, I think the thing I'd love people to understand is that plenty of scenes get cut out of the show and you're like I did all that work that was two days of work and you know we practically finished dressing that set and now it's like you know it's on the editing room floor before we even shot it um, so uh, and some of that stuff you just have to like let go but um, I think the audience should know that there's a lot of like a lot for every department of work that goes into it that you'll never see and even the stuff you do see following like how we got there is um uh well it's a whole nother probably interview but you know where you you have so many details that uh this was a this was that the designer and the director wanted and then this is what was available and then this is um what we could afford you know and those things um i was telling emily the story earlier about um that uh, I was on some show and I was complaining about the fact that something was cut and they were like, you know, I said, no, that's just not fair, you know, that should be, and the production designer, she was kind of snarky and she's like, oh, well, we'll put it in the credits, you know. Don said that this should be, you know, you guys should know that this scene was, kind of like, no, it, that doesn't exist like that and that's showbiz, you know. Um, probably several. Um, one I can think of instantly because I saw a picture recently in my, photos of Seth is on the Santa Claus 3 which was this Tim Allen part of the series of those Santa Claus films um, we were doing Santa's um, workshop which is where they make all the toys and there was a mezzanine level and on the mezzanine level we had on the first level we had very strictly laid out this is where toys of wood are making this is where toys of metal are being made this is where dolls are you know we had this kind of figured out and then we got to the mezzanine and like you know like, oh i don't know what is, what's up there how much are we going to see and i started doing i did a set that, or a little table called quality control and i found this giant magnifying glass like 18 20 inches wide magnifying glass and it was framed and beautiful and i put it on the quality control table that was upstairs in this mezzanine and then they had martin short did a gag where he like walked by it and does this whoop you know like you see him kind of and playing through the weird optics of the um and you know that was a payoff that was like oh yeah i put that there and they used it so i love that i love when it happens I, there isn't, and it's so funny that's brought up because I did Community, and on Community there was a, a gag, which is probably a meme now, about the uh, all the films that Nicolas Cage did, and Abed, one of the characters, like had them all on post-its, and we had a bit where we they were strung all over the apartment, and you know, and I'd done t two movies with him, so I felt like I wanted to feature them. I did Red Rock West, and then I did Gone in 60 Seconds. I would love if there was that, you know, the six degrees of Nick Nick Cage f set decorators. I'm going to tell you this story, which is no one will know of this movie because it never even came out. But this was one of my favorite sets. And it was a favorite set part, partly because we were in the middle of nowhere in, in New Mexico. And it was a set of a pyromaniac ex-priest. And so, you know, I was, again, you know, if I was doing interior design, you know, we do kitchens, bathrooms, you know, bedrooms, hallways, whatever. And, you know, in set deck, you know, you're doing characters and sometimes they have like disturbing backstories. And this guy, I, I don't remember if he ends up, you know, igniting himself or some kind of, you know, t tragic end of the, because the movie didn't come out, I forgot. But it was called Cultivating Charlie. And I did this house of this guy who was um, angry at religion. And so all of the set was these strange uh, shrines, each one highlighting sort of like the fault of that religion wrapped up in like found objects and statuary and melted wax. And, and it was to me, it was me sort of exercising my sort of, you know, reformed Catholic life and, uh, and you know, getting my demons out. So I, when people ask about that, that one was like a, an art installation that was so driven by a character I kind of understood deeply. I did a Michael Mann show um, years ago. It was, it was called, um, what was it called? Uh, I don't remember. It ended up, Michael Mann ended up remaking this. We did it as a TV show. He made this movie Heat. And um, it was a set where there was some kind of like gang member. And Michael Mann said to me, he said, you can just make this set weird. We want it to be a little scary and creepy. And um, I 
I filled a terrarium with crickets. I went to the vet, the, and, and you know, the sound guy hated me, but Michael Mann loved it. And they put it right behind the guy's head because they were like, there were just as we, first they're bugs and nobody loves that. And then they're in this little like terrarium, which means the guy is sort of like their pets. And then like everything about that made him creepier and scarier. <laughs> And I was surprised, you know, other people would tell you, yeah, Don, don't put live animals on the set. Who said you could do that? And anyway, I did it, and they liked it. Michael Mann, Michael Mann said it was okay. Hi, I'm Jan Pascal with the Set Decorator Society of America, former Academy governor, and um, thrilled to be here. Oh, my gosh. Uh, some good, some bad. <laughs> Are you willing to say that? <laughs> some good, some not so great. <laughs> <laughs> but they look good. Um, I was uh, fortunate to receive an Oscar for a movie called Mank um, to, a few years ago. Uh, there's a movie airing now on um, Amazon called Air that's about Air Jordan. It's with Ben Affleck. It's my second movie with Ben Affleck. The first one was Argo, which won Best Picture in 2012, which was pretty exciting. Um, there's a movie coming out called, uh, also on Amazon, December 1st, called Candy Cane Lane, which is quite an epic Christmas movie. I have done some Obi-Wan Kenobi series, um, a great film that I love called Sicario, the first one. Oh my God, it was insane. It was insane. We were finding Chuck Taylor's online for like, $30,000 for one pair of used sneakers. I had no idea that the sneaker world existed. I mean, it was really insane. But I got, you know, sometimes the, the, the universe opens up for us and it gives us things. And I was madly searching for shoes online and I was madly searching for posters and I found a bunch of posters of Nike from the 80s with great sports players in them. And I bought a bunch of them, and finally the guy, you know, sometimes on eBay it becomes a community, and the guy reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I have a friend named Jordy. You should talk to him. He used to have a Nike museum in Vegas, but he closed it down, but he still has the collection. And at the same time, one of our producers came down and said, hey, I grew up with this guy. I went to school with this guy named Jordy, and he's got some Nike shoes and I, I couldn't believe how lucky that was. So I had an in with the producer and an in with the guy that I just spent a fortune on posters with. And this guy was amazing. So we rented, he had like prototype Nikes that were made for the famous runner um, Prefontaine. They were prototype shoes and sadly Prefontaine died before he could wear them in the Olympics that year but this guy had those shoes and he had unbelievable prototypes and one of a kinds and we flew him down <laughs> he literally he shipped me some that were less valuable but there were some that he literally hand carried and and he stood on the set while they were there just like a security guard and I, every night I took him off the set, I locked, we locked him up. We had a crew, crew member stay and they locked him up. And oh my God, I don't know what we would have done without him. But really, our prop master, JP Jones, did an amazing job. He got into this sneaker culture because there are people that make knockoffs and there are, there's like YouTube videos of how to make knockoff Jordans which who knew, right? But he found these guys and figured out how to make a prototype of the shoe, the actual shoe. It was incredible. I mean, I feel, I love what we do. And I feel like we're the storytellers. We help flesh out the characters. We embellish the surroundings. We, we tell you where you are and what you're looking at. And I think that so much depends on us. I don't think a lot of people realize it. I think people think that we just walk into places and that's what they are. You know, I always love to show before and after pictures of sets that I've worked on. Um, you know, the, in Argo, the CIA office is jam-packed with 40-something desks. 
it was an empty space at the basement of the LA Times. And the same with, um, with Air. We had an abandoned, kind of hem, half abandoned building in Santa Monica. And we literally took it down to concrete and ripped up the carpet, installed carpet in the manner of the 80s with a nice band around it, inspired by the movie 9 to 5, actually. And brought in, we, we ended up decorating over 40 offices plus the bullpen. It was insane. And we had four and a half weeks prep. My crew, Tony Andreas, my lead man, and, and my crew were just amazing. And my buyer, Joni Indersky. Oh, my God. Insane. <laughs> no, it's not an option. <laughs> it's not. It's just not an option. We have, to, we have to find whatever it is. I mean, I have something in my home. I was just thinking about it on the way over here. I did a movie in 1989, which dates me a little bit, but... It was called The Handmaid's Tale, and it now everybody knows about The Handmaid's Tale, but at this time it was, you know, Robert Duvall, Faye Dunaway, um, N- Natasha Richardson, who was amazing. She was the handmaiden, and I needed to find an antique birthing stool. I called everybody I could think of. I called the medical, Alpha Medical, I called their East Coast office. I called every medical supply I could think of, and they all thought I was crazy. One day I was out shopping. It was great antique shopping there. And I had this big cargo van. And I would drive around <laughs> North Carolina in this crazy cargo van. And I, I don't have a great sense of direction. I have a great sense of, of story, but not of direction. Um, I got totally lost. And I didn't, I had, I didn't even know what town I was in. And I pulled into this shopping center that I saw, and I thought, well, at least I could ask for directions. Way in the corner, there was one light on in the shopping center. It was an antique store. I opened the door to go ask for directions, and inside the door was a birthing stool, an antique birthing stool. They had to pick me up off the floor. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I have to have that. They thought I was crazy to be so excited about this. It had sat there for years, but how does you know i've been so fortunate i feel like sometimes i'm just led to the right places you know so we flesh it out as best we can we go over it with the designer we walk them through we try to walk the director through but the real telling moment is when the actors embellish it they get in there and they i've had so many actors come to me and say thank you so much, I know who my character is now. And to me, there's no greater compliment. And also a compliment if people think that we walked into a place that was existing and they think that it just was like that. And I always say that as hard as it is to do what we do, because we've got thousands and thousands of little pieces and large pieces and manufactured pieces, when we bring it all together and we tell the story, if nobody notices, that's kind of a compliment. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's sort of that we believe this, and, and it doesn't look like a set. It looks like a real place. It looks like a real environment. Can't have a better compliment than that. It's nice when they recognize it, too, but, <laughs> but if they don't recognize it, I'm still happy. Hello, I'm David Smith. I'm a set decorator. I've been a set decorator since 1980 when I joined um, CBS in production. And I, um, I've been a set decorator then since 1981. I'm a member of the SDSA, a member of the Local 44 in LA as a set decorator, Local 52 in New York as a set decorator, and I'm also a member of the Motion Picture and Television Academies. Um, I've been at this a long time, and it's just a great, for me anyway, it's a great, great, great um, um, vocation and uh, occupation, I should say. <laughs> uh, and I love the craft and the art of it. I started out in theater. I wanted to be an actor, and um, as part of my acting apprentice at the Cleveland Playhouse, when I was 19 years old, they put me in the shop, and I built scenery, and then they told me that I was not much of an actor, but I was a nice enough person, and they asked me back to work in the shop. And I debated for a split second, and then decided that I would go back there, and then I started to work in the prop department, and then I took over the prop department, 
and I did 14 years at the Cleveland Playhouse where I also designed, not only did I do all the props for 170 productions, but I designed costumes, sets, and um, every now and then uh, the props as well. Well, my movie that gets the most attention is The Holiday, and then um, I've also did uh, The Last Holiday with Queen Latifah. The Holiday, of course, is uh, Jack Black, Cameron Diaz, uh, Jude Law, and um, Kate Winslet, a Nancy Myers movie, uh, and that always gets a lots of attention. I did um, Crazy Stupid Love, and um, in TV I did the old, I'm do, now currently doing the old man. I did um, LA Law, I did NYPD Blue. About 10 years ago, we were doing a pilot, and Brett Ratner was the production, I uh, was the director, and Ida Random was the production designer. And we had, originally the show was gonna go to the UK and shoot at the museum there. It was set in the museum, and then part of the show was set in the UK. And uh, we did it all here in LA. They decided at the last minute not to go to the UK, and instead they, um, they booked a location at USC downtown in the Philosophy Library, and they told us that we had to dress it to shoot on a Saturday and a Sunday and strike it on Sunday, but we couldn't load in until Friday night. So we had six five-ton trucks full of set dressing, large tables, display cases, card catalogs, a 14-foot high bookcase that had to be filled, and somehow, and not only that, but there was no elevator, and then we had to take it up two flights of stairs. So all the set dressing by the crew had to be hand carried up. We got it all loaded in on Friday night. We came back Saturday morning and dressed until they were ready to shoot at noon. Then they shot and finished the day on Saturday. We came back on Sunday after they finished, struck it, and everything got returned to the prop houses on Monday. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, whatever it is that you're missing is always the strangest one. Um, and sometimes the, the crazy thing about it is that sometimes the most simple things are the hardest to find. Um, most of my career has been pretty much storytelling and, and movies that are, are real people in real situations and not fantasy or any of that. So I haven't had anything terribly strange as a, as a prop or as a piece of set dressing as a whole. But, um, I mean, sometimes things are challenged. I know I worked with Jan Pascal um, on air, and believe it or not, we were trying to find a Slurpee machine, and we really could not find a real 7-Eleven Slurpee machine. So we went with a frozen margarita machine, but even that was hard to find in the time frame that we were doing. And we finally found one and did, you know, but it, it's crazy because, as I said, sometimes the simplest things are the hardest things to find. I, I think I wish that um, how much thought goes into it. I mean, visually we're telling the story that the, that the scriptwriter has written and, and that the director and is, is aiming to you know, make happen. And so hand in hand with the production designer um, and, and all of our teams, we, you know, we want to give it a bit of a history. We want to, you have about a split second. I always say in television you have a split second to know where you're at. So, you know, I worked with a designer once who wanted to paint rooms, all the same rooms, the whole show in a tone of blue. And it was like, no, you need to, to have a color so that the minute we see someone, we know that that's their, a different space. So I, I think, you know, everything that's put on set is done intentionally. It, it, it helps to tell the story. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I love people who do. I, I, I don't hide anything. Um, I, I do quite often reuse things from show to show to show, um, uh, but uh, no, I don't intentionally do, do that. I think it's fun, and, and I admire people who do it. Um, it just isn't my style. Hi, my name is Julie Drock. I'm a set decorator and also a member of the SDSA. I've been a set decorator now for about 18 years. Recently, I did American Horror Stories, their anthology series. Um, I also did Key and Peele for many years, a show called Casual, Dear White People, and so many others. I'm not sure how many of them are very popular to watch, though. Definitely the collaboration. There's so many different people to collaborate with, not only on my crew, but also directors, costume designers, 
location personnel, uh, just so many ideas and and working them all out together and that kind of teamwork I think is a really positive thing and one of my favorite things but also that it's always new I'm always learning something that I didn't know before changing time periods changing characters developing characters through objects and environments and lending to the story in that way is it's just so much fun so <laughs> I mean, this is such an interesting question because I feel like so many set stories or behind the scenes stories tend to be a little bit glamorized or that's what people want to hear because it's Hollywood. Um, mine tend to be more oddball or unglamorized. Um, one of my first jobs was holding Steve Harvey's spit bucket for a Burger King commercial. It was completely repulsive, but I had the best time. I was. 22 and I just sat and waited for him to smile and say how good his burger was and spit it into the thing I was holding. Um, I think these are the things that people don't realize happen. Another favorite sort of behind the scenes story of mine is with puppets. I've worked on a handful of puppet shows and there's so much life imbued into these puppets through these puppeteers and on many occasions I have watched takes with these puppets, watched these puppets perform a scene and then when they call cut they sort of just crumble lifelessly. And I always find it just a touch heartbreaking, this instantaneous millisecond of heartbreak when I watch their, their lives leave them. Um, but other than that, I mean, behind the scenes stuff or, or set stories, I mean, there's just a million trillion, but those are kind of my faves. Glass cases that contain giant amounts of worms that have to fit a human inside so the worms can eat them. Anything from the future or anything that's a, a strange comedy point are always the weirdest. Futuristic exercise equipment that we ended up mostly having to build. But anyways, sorry. Maybe how hard it is. That it, I think that there's a lot of misconception, even from producers, even from people within this industry, who think that we kind of just go to Ikea and pick fun things and everybody's made a living room and everybody uh, built their kids bunk bed and feels proud and kind of thinks that we're just doing that easy thing but we're really setting up environments for new characters a dozen times a week. Sometimes with detail in an empty space, detail that should reflect decades of life and decades of change and and experiences with that character. And I think a lot of people don't realize how complex that is and how much richness and how many details go into a good set. Hi, I'm Claire Kaufman, SDSA. I'm a set decorator uh, with Local 44. Uh, so my film work would be uh, Little Women, uh, White Noise, and most recently Oppenheimer. I mean, you work your entire you know, career waiting to get on a project where everything just falls into place, you know, the cinematography, the acting, the, the sets, the costumes, and that was one of those times where it was just all magic. <laughs> so, you know, that piece was really interesting because we went from 1925 to 1963. Um, you know, I would say my most important thing with my job is research. Um, I do a ton of research. We had adorned the walls in Universal with just, you know, every set. And I think you get a real sense of how the film is going to arc and the textures and the looks. And then, um, you know, you really can envision what it's going to be. <laughs> uh, Lots of looking, so, and we were, you know, we were lucky enough to shoot in LA, so I had wonderful prop houses to go to, and, you know, we curated stuff and bought stuff, but we did a lot of rentals, actually, for that particular project. I mean, probably one of the most uh, difficult and um, challenging sets was the supermarket from White Noise, <laughs> which I hope to never do again. <laughs> But it was really, it was fun. You know, in the, in the end, it really became almost like a giant math equation. You know, setting the shelves, figuring out the products, you know. It was, it was a challenge, but it was fun. You know, there's so much more than just shopping, being a set decorator. It's uh, budgeting, running a crew, the research part of it. Um, you know, uh, being organized, um, having good relationships with vendors. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, 
it's just you know and I think what I love about it and why it's still interesting is because it is learning about all these different things and learning about period pieces and future and you know and putting that into a visual context is an amazing job um, I collect seashells um, but, you know, it's always nice to sort of uh, have a little piece of memorabilia from all the things that you do. Um, I think how challenging it is, you know, I, you know if it, there's a saying, if it was easy, anyone could do it. So I think that's probably, you know, it's, it's, I've been doing it for 25 years now, so, and I love it as much now as I did when I first started. <laughs> Thank you, Don, Jan, David, Julie, and Claire. Thank you to the SDSA, Sex Decorator Society of America. Uh, these, com- uh, these conversations were recorded live from the West Edge Design Fair on set, designed by Marbe Designs, featuring Banana Republic Home. Special thanks to them as well. This is the Design Messengers, an audio essay crafted to get your week off to a great start by sharing ideas to launch you into being the best you can be in all your endeavors, but specifically as a creative in the design and architecture space. Thank you for listening. If you are not already a subscriber, please consider subscribing to the show so you receive every episode of the Design Messengers, as well as Convo by Design, Drinking About Design, and all of the other concepts that we, uh, that we publish here on this feed automatically when they're published. If you're listening to us for the first time, you can find Convo by Design everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. If you are so inclined, please also consider following along on Instagram at Convo by Design with an X. Thanks again for listening. Be well and take today first. Mm-hmm.